In this video, we're actually going to get back down the scale from high A. In the last video, we learned how to go up the scale from low G to high A. Now we're going to practice going from the very top of the scale, of the bagpipe scale, from high A all the way down to low G, where all the holes are covered. So remember that high A is when you have your left ring finger on the chanter, covering its hole, right? And then your other two fingers and thumb are off of the chanter to start on high A. Remember also that your right pinky is off of the chanter. These three fingers down here are covering their holes. So that's what high A looks like. Now, before we launch into getting down the scale, I want to give you an exercise for what I'll call steady blowing, steady blowing. Because one of the things you're going to have to master, even just on the practice chanter, is blowing very steadily. If you've had any experience playing other wind instruments especially, you'll know that when you're playing a trumpet, when you're playing a saxophone, even a clarinet, things, things like that, instruments like that, you may have to blow harder to get higher notes. That's not the case on the bagpipe. On the bagpipe, on the practice chanter and the bagpipe itself, you're basically keeping a completely steady pressure. So an exercise that you can do is blowing high A down to low A and back up again, back and forth, to get used to blowing at the same steady pressure. And remember that going from high A down to low A, you're gonna be simply dropping those three fingers, these three fingers down here are already in position for low A because your pinky's off. So you're simply going to have to cover thumb, index finger, and middle finger up here to get down to low A. This is a useful exercise because the tendency might be to either overblow on the top or underblow. So if you're getting something like this, you're probably underblowing, right? If you're getting something like this, you're overblowing. The other thing this exercise will do for you is allow you to uh, begin to what do what's called ear training. You'll be, begin to learn to recognize what are called pitches, the correct pitches that you want to play at. So the low A and high A should sound very similar. Da -dee, da -dee. Not da -dee or da -dee. Okay, so this will help you literally train your ear to hear the correct pitches. You may want to practice that a few times. So here we go, down the scale from high A to high G. See what I did there? I lowered my thumb onto its hole, but I picked up my ring finger. Down to F to E. Now here's again where it gets tricky, going from E down to D, going from top hand to bottom hand, upper hand to lower hand, where I have to simultaneously drop this finger, but pick up these three fingers and drop my pinky. Let me do that again. From there, it's pretty smooth sailing. C down to B. Here's kind of a toggle where I'm dropping this finger and picking up my pinky. Do that again. And then but down to low A to low G. So here's the whole scale from high A down to low G. Now, one more word on what are called crossing noises. In the last video, I talked about crossing noises from D to E and back again. You definitely want to avoid those. But there are actually two different kinds of crossing noises. There are the really clearly audible kind, where you hear a blip or a blop 
like you just heard. Something like that. But then there's another kind. I call those actually positive crossing noises. There's nothing positive about them or good about them, but I call them positive because you can very clearly, very clearly hear them when they happen, even when they're very minor. You can hear like a little catch or a little blip. There's another type of crossing noise that I call a negative crossing noise. Some, I think one one or two other teachers refer to them as phantom crossing noises. These types of crossing noises happen when you're trying so hard to avoid a positive crossing noise that there's a modulation in the sound. So something like this. So it happens when your fingers aren't moving simultaneously from one note to another, and you're just trying to avoid you're trying to avoid that, so you're doing something like this. And you can hear that little modulation, right? That is actually amplified on the full bagpipe chanter. So you want to get into the habit of practicing these crossovers um, uh, so that they really happen with great simultaneity, okay? So as a final thing for this little episode that we've done now. Let's go all the way up and then back down <clears throat> the bagpipe scale from low G to high A. <laughs> Feel free to take a breath and then start on high A and go back down. It's going to take you a while to master <clears throat> how you're placing your fingers and your hands on the chanter. I strongly recommend the use of, of some kind of small mirror. I've used this same mirror. This was my dad's shaving mirror. I've used this since I was six years old. <laughs> and I, I have it, always have had it right here on my practice table, whatever house I've ever, whatever place I've lived in, wherever I've gone in the world, I've always had this mirror with me. And Mostly I use it so that it's kind of off to the side, so I'm kind of looking at it in my peripheral vision to make sure that my hands and fingers are in the right place. When you're starting to play the scale, you may want to have it directly in front of you so that you can see your fingers and hands and see how you're holding the chanter. Um, one really important thing to avoid when you're, um, when you're playing the practice chanter or the bagpipe chanter is allowing your fingers to kind of curl because that's going to lead to all kinds of weird noises and sounds where you're not quite covering the holes properly. Um, one of the, um, the, 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 the primary things that I see is this middle finger of the upper hand to kind of curl. You desperately, a lot of pipers desperately want to feel that hole with the tip of their, with the tip of their middle finger. Be careful to just kind of let that sit there um, and not allow that to curl up. But basically, if you're starting to see any of your fingers kind of curl like this, um, see if you can correct that because you don't want an absolutely rigid, rigid, rigid hand position. I like a kind of a natural hand position. Some, some instructors and some pipers will play with their fingers very, very straight or even almost in a locked position. I've never been able to do that. <laughs> some pipers do that. I can't do it. Um, but most pipers I know play with a sort of a natural hand position. So a mirror could definitely help you there. Um, that's probably enough for this lesson. Um, good luck. <laughs>